Well, hello there, good people. Hi. Let's see. Sassafras Res got a quarter acre, and Stone Date Farmer Farm for All has got 93. Doesn't actually own it, but it's managing 93 acres is a lot. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to have some friends to help out with that because it's a lot of stuff to take on just by yourself. And Wish Our Project has been talking about a lot, a lot about swales and rainwater catchment systems. Good stuff, good stuff. Planning on fruit. Okay, cool. Let me go make a modification here and uh, kill my volume. There we go. All right, I can turn this thing up if I want to. All right. What's going on out there? So, let's see. You found some free hay. Yeah. Lots of organic matter you can just roll out on the ground. Hmm. As somebody was talking about getting alfalfa hay, which is good, because if you're concerned about persistent uh, broadleaf herbicides, let me put this coffee cup down somewhere. There we go. If you're worried about consistent broadleaf herbicides, getting alfalfa hay is great because you know it doesn't have any in it. You can't grow alfalfa if there's been broadleaf herbicides sprayed on it. Uh, Katie Moore, buckwheat seeds. Mm. Try nature seed for bulk, and I know Baker Creek has some, but I don't know how much they have. Well, they had some. I don't know how much they have now. Uh, Baker Creek seed had some seeds at least a couple of months ago in, in buckwheat. And I got, uh, do I have the, uh, no, it's in the back room at the moment. I, I got the uh, the little, little, uh, quarter ounce packets so there's there's like maybe 60 to 80 seeds per packet and i got four of those instead of getting a whole pound but i got a few just so i could plant them and see how they did and i figure if i can grow them for one year and harvest the seeds from them then i can i can spread them around and maybe get something out of that let me go to uh gypsy and vanilla gorilla jeff says so jason i planted onion seeds three times now and i still don't have any any ideas oh I've always had problems getting onions started from seed, which is one of the reasons why I got into growing the uh, the top setting onions, the, the Egyptian walking onions. Those, I can just take those little bulbs off the top and put those into some potting soil and let those sprout and then divide up those little those little bits and then let those grow into, into onions. It's not as good as having those big bulbs, big bulbous onions that you can cut, but um, it's something that, that me with my brown thumbs can grow. Um, I guess I should ask you, how far have your seeds progressed whenever you planted them? Did you get something to sprout and then they failed or did they not germinate at all? And then we'll try to diagnose it from there. We've got a lot of people in here. Hi, Carl. Carl's off the grids in here. we got Swarmstead. Of course, Mel with Baker Lake Homestead. Mel has got all kinds of stuff growing right now. She's going to have a huge garden. I think, I think her plan is over planting. <laughs> so that she loses loses some stuff, uh, she'll be able to recover. Uh, Sass Press Red says you got buckwheat and bulk it as your standard. Okay, let's see if I can find that. Azure Standard dot com Azure Standard Seeds. Okay, I see them. I'll bring that over here and drop that in. It's a food co-op, cool. Well, I figure if uh, I figure if Sassafras has had some good experience with them, it's worth uh, it's worth sharing a link for them. I haven't tried them out yet, but I can I can try them. There's Joe Serrano. Hello, Joe. All right. So what do we got going on here? There's Robert at Homestead Aquarius. Craze Family Homestead. This Amy is saying I use rubber made containers with lids for onions. Broadcast them and keep them moist. Yeah. Um, really early on, any, any sort of seedling that you're starting, if you can if you can maintain humidity, that's that's really, really a big factor in keeping them alive. Uh, having a 
a starting mix that you're starting them in that sterilize so that it doesn't have fungus and bacteria that will take down the seedling whenever it's very young is important too. You are going to want fungus and bacteria working in your in your soil that you're ultimately planting everything out into. But whenever seed is first starting, it's very susceptible to being attacked by those those microorganisms. I can't talk microorganisms in the soil, which is the reason why we like to use things like you know coconut coir or uh, peat moss and perlite and things like that. They don't have any nutrients in them. They shouldn't have anything living in them. Um, a standard method for making sure that you don't have anything else living in the starting mixes is to pour your boiling water over that starting mix whenever you're first hydrating it to kill off whatever's in there. And then whenever it cools down, you squeeze out the excess moisture, you put that into your propagation trays and put your seeds in there. That way you don't have anything else in there except moisture and that seed. And once you've got that seed to sprout and germinate, then you can add fertilizer or add other organic matter to uh, to that scenario or situation once you know that the seedling isn't going to be overwhelmed. Um, but that's good for most of the things that we want to grow that are, are cultivated crops, commonly cultivated, cultivated crops. The stuff that grows naturally wild, you can usually get away with just tossing it in the dirt and it'll take off because that's what it's accustomed to. The stuff that we cultivate, we kind of have to baby it a little bit. It doesn't really survive well on its own. All right, let's see. And let's see, Stone Dave is saying something to bake a leg. I have heard that it causes problems long term, but I haven't seen problems in the, in the short term. I'd be careful about buying compost just first. Let me back up. That was to bake a leg, bake a leg, bake a leg. And da -da -da. Putting in new beds, eight to be exact. I was wondering if I can just plant straight in compost where it's going to. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, what, what, what I was just talking about. Um, you can use the same. Yeah, okay, depending upon the, the amount of available or free nitrogen that's in that compost to begin with. Um, obviously, it's, if it's too hot, it's, it's not going to be good for your plants. Whenever they're first starting, they don't need fertilizer. They don't need to be fertilized. Uh, but after they've gotten their first set of true leaves on, you'll, you'll have the first leaves that come up. Those are the, the monocots if it's the grass or dicots, two leaves if it's a, di if it's a dicot. After the first true leaves, that'll be the next set of leaves that appear. After this first set of leaves appear, that's whenever you can you can they can benefit from um, having fertilizer added. But uh, if you're just looking for a starting mix, you can take your compost and sift it, and then pour hot boiling water in that to give it its first hydration, the same as you would with peat moss, um, and that would sterilize what you're starting in. That this kind of important to sterilize what you're starting in because that prevents the possibility of um, those other microorganisms just overpowering whatever it is that you're, that you're trying to germinate. Okay. <laughs> 2019, just around a germinated six Eureka lemon seeds. Of those six, only one is left and it's reaching for the sky and it's doing good. But wow, two years of growth. Uh, yeah, starting, starting fruit seeds from, or fruit trees from seed is is a game of patience, but it can be greatly rewarded because whenever you're introducing brand new seeds that are that are produced from sexual reproduction of two different parents, what you get out of that is you don't know you don't know what you're going to get. So it could, it could, it could be something the world's never seen before. It could be a great success or it could be a, a a great failure. And until it produces fruit of its own, you just won't know. And most of the most of the the fruit trees that we have out there right now are established varieties that somebody's taken a rootstock and grafted a known variety on top of that, and that's what you're growing and you're producing. But they're genetically all the same. So Joe started Eureka Lemon. What he gets out of it isn't going to be exactly the same as every Eureka Lemon out there. It's going to be something unique and and, and special. Whether it's better than the original or not, I don't know. And we won't know until until they until they produce their fruit and we can see what came out of them. Uh, da, 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 da. So Stone Day Farmer says, I'd like looking at the study from the local agriculture university has found that a lot of people with raised beds have like 30 to 60 percent organic matter and that ended up causing problems. Yeah, your 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 better organic soils, if you're looking at uh, by weight organic matter, are 
18, 20 percent at, at the top. Beyond that, you have something that's starting to head towards the muck soil, and there's there's problems that are associated with that. All right. Is it the same with pumpkins? Going to try all compost. Okay, bake a leg and let's take it home. So I was going to try all compost in the beds, not dirt. People do that. Um, uh, take a look at what uh, Charles Downing is doing. He's growing in mostly compost, and it, and it works for him. Um, I'm not going to say it's not going to work, <laughs> but it does take a lot of compost. To try a sacrifice first born method for my vining fields. Hmm. Now, why? What? Okay. I, let me ask a question of, of Wixar Project here. What is the advantage to getting rid of the? Uh, I, I'm presuming we're, we're talking about the, the first ones to germinate or the the first uh, the, the first shoots to come out. You have to go ahead and cut those back. What What is the What is the the advantage that you hope to get from that? Now here's the question: Cow manure or horse manure? If you had to pick one, if I had to pick one, uh, horse manure almost certainly better than the than, than cow manure because, well, <laughs> have a look at the diet. Um, okay, yeah, get, getting rid of the first fruit. There's a okay. I don't want to. I don't want to 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 offend anyone, but there's a if you if you if you study. Uh, the, the Christian Bible, there's a, a principle of, of sacrificing first fruits um, in any case. And it's introduced as, as a way of, of, uh, of showing proper respect to the creator, but there may indeed be a, a functional purpose for doing that. It'd be interesting to see. So calling the first fruits off so the vine can grow. Yeah. Well, you have the same situation occurring with uh, peppers and everything else whenever you pluck those blooms off. And so you don't have that that first initial harvest, but you encourage the, the plant to grow more and you have a better harvest later on instead of having the, the plant rush to the end of its reproductive cycle. So although it was introduced in the Bible as, as a as a form of sacrifice without a why behind it, there there is probably a very good reason why. And I think a lot of the things that were in there if if they would included a why or 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 a rational reason behind doing them, a lot more people would actually start doing them. So they understood what the reason behind it was. Chris's clever craft, clever can't talk. Clever craft says, "Hello everyone, sorry I'm late. I had a parent teacher conference at six. Okay, so you're this is Chris Sunlightner. Okay, cool. Uh, did you change the channel name, or is this just another another channel that you're that you're using?" Hi, Chris. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. So here, here's an interesting concept. Carl's saying I thought the horse manure was supposed to be worse because the horse's stomachs don't digest a lot of the seeds that, that weeds have. You're going to wind up with, with, with weed seeds anyway, regardless of what you're using. Uh, they're either going to be in the soil bank already or they're going to be blown in or... In, in, Oh, I don't know. I didn't think there was anything wrong with Sunlightner, but if Clever Craft uh, reflects more what you're planning on doing with the channel, it might. Be a better. Okay, maybe you're not. All right, we're back. There we go. Screen froze. Yay. Okay. Um, my, my personal purpose for using horse manure has more to do with the smell. <laughs> I I think horse manure smells a lot better than cow manure. <laughs> I don't like the smell of cow manure. <laughs> but 
horses smell better. Mainly it's because of, the, of what horses are eating for the most part. I, I think they have the potential to add more nitrogen to your to your soil than than cow manure. Hello, Tim. Here's Ridge Life. Uh, well, okay, so yeah, Tasper said the issue with horse manure could be the wormers that give horses, but you know, cattlemen give wormer to cattle as well. Those sorts of things are always going to be a, a, an issue depending upon what you're planning on accomplishing. If you're looking for a for an organic certification, um, horse or cow manure, either one is not the big question. The big question is what was going on, what was in the diets, and how were those animals handled prior to their uh, their, their manure getting to you. Uh, either one is going to be potentially really good. All right, we got Marius Tulsa Fox showed up. Of course, we have our, our, our live stream. Shout out to Marius Tulsa Fox pinned it up there at the top of the comments. She is a Royal Oak subscriber, so as you, or Royal Oak member. As you know, we have memberships available, and if you have the the Royal Oak level of membership, then every time we do a a, a a video or a live stream, one of the people who is a member of that level is going to get a shout out. So today it's Mary. Um, speaking of memberships, we've reached a, a threshold where we get to add a new emoji, which is kind of fun. And I figure it would be kind of fun to do it on a live stream. So what would you people like to see as a new emoji that we can put out here? Like just real quick, uh, come in here and show you some examples of the emojis that we already have. So we've got a bee emoji, a butterfly emoji. And we're going to screen lock again. Uh, we got a garden gnome and the happy gardener emoji. These are all emojis that we have so far. Are these not showing? A rotten tomato. <laughs> that would be fun. Let me see. All right. I just realized they, they don't show in StreamYard. They just show as the uh, as the the text form. Okay. In 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 the uh, in the YouTube stream they show up. Okay. I was looking at my at my chat in in StreamYard. Burr. So we've got four. We get to add one more. How about a praying mantis or a grasshopper? Praying mantis is good. I like I like the idea of praying mantis. A rotten tomato, yeah, that's cool, but we might have to do a little bit of work to to uh, to make it look like a rotten tomato. All right, but as you know, members' inputs are going to be worth a little bit more <laughs> than everyone's. Uh, I'm going to have Mary and Sassafras, who are the the members who are on right now, uh, give give us the final decision on what we want the new emoji to be. And Wickshire Project says, do red wigglers have a different consumption and temperature requirement uh, as compared to other types of worms? They, yeah, they have quite a few different requirements. Um, I can't recite them off the top of my head. <laughs> but yes, they do. <laughs> they have different dietary requirements as well. Red wigglers are composting worms. They don't really live in soil. They make soil, but they don't live in it. They they live in the uh, in the organic horizon above the soil surface horizon. Mary says a big green bug. Mm, I mean, yeah, man, this could be a big green bug or a grasshopper. Normal earthworms can handle much much colder temperatures. Gypsy and Vanilla Gorilla is asking how long I've been monetized. Less than a month now. Reds tolerate heat better eh, to a certain extent, but you get them above 80 degrees, they're not going to be happy. So a little bit, but not much. 
Mary is down with the with the man. Oh, sorry. Sassafras Red is down with the Mantis. What do you think, Mary? Katie did. Ew. Not a bush cricket. <laughs> okay. Praying Mantis. All right. Let's go here and uh, let's have a look at our, our shared screen. We've got our, our channel monetization tab up here where we get to upload emojis. Of course, there's the, the preview of the ones we've got already. There's little uh, little things that we have to do to to get one. Let me switch to here. Hang on, Sarah. Stop screen and here. Let me share this tab here. All right. All right. So we're going to Pixabay. Hi, Gail at Gail Southern Living. Praying mantises. Yeah, praying mantises are awesome. All right. So here is Pixabay where we can find all kinds of free images that we can use. We want to use illustrations. Okay. And I'm going to look for a praying mantis. Let's see if we can find one. All right. So there's a couple. We've got illustration, photos, vector graphics. Let's try vector graphics. Eh. Nothing spectacular there, but all right. What do you think of this one here? Use that as a uh, as a basis for it. What do you think? Does that one look good? Hmm. Praying mantises are not awesome, says the Gypsy Vanilla Girl, but there's more to that statement that's coming up, I'm sure. They're not awesome, they are. Okay, Red likes the mantis. Okay, we're going to go with this one. All right, so all I got to do is click on free download, and it is free. I'm going to just download the small one, 640 by 617. It's a PNG. It's coming into our downloads. I'll be there in just a moment. Okay, there it is. All right. I don't need this anymore. And let me go to a different share. They kill hummingbirds. <laughs> yeah, they can kill fish too. I mean, they can kill anything. Um, let me go application window. Uh, da, 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 we're going to our paint.net application. There we go. And all right, there we go. Let's go over my application window and I'm going to open. This is paint.net. It's a it's a free version of the Paint program. It's not administered by Microsoft. Microsoft can't talk. All right. All right, so I'm going to look for downloads. Praying Mantis that we just got. Let's open that up. All right, and somebody's already erased the background on this one, so I'm going to go and save this one. As an emoji. Okay, it says file size is 165.3 kilobytes. Well, I now can do some other things. Let me take a look at the dimensions here. My dimensions are 640 by 617. I'm gonna need to do something real quick here. 
So I'm going to select here. There we go. Copy this. The thing about emojis is they want them to be um, they want to be at a, a one to one aspect ratio. So our image has to be the same height and width. So I'm going to open up a new tab here and paste our image here. Now we've got one that is the same height and width. So, and I'm going to grab my eraser. We're going to make it about 40. And erase the rest of this background down here. There we go. Now we'll save it as Mantis emoji. It's a PNG, which is just fine. Okay, we're now at 166.2 kilobytes. All right, we can go up to one megabyte. So I'll go to image, resize, by percentage. Let's go eh, 150%. Get a little bit bigger. Choose save as again. And it says it already exists, but that will. Oh, yeah, we can go bigger. All right. Let's resize it again. 200%. There we go. And save. And we'll just do this until it gets close to. Okay, it's a little over one megabyte. I just need to resize it a little bit smaller. If you guys get to get started doing this, this is basically how you do it. You find an image that you want to make an emoji of. So at 1.1. And then just get to a one to one aspect ratio. And work on its size until it's just below one megabyte. There we go. 909.8 kilobytes. That's perfect. All right. Now I can just close this out because we don't need it anymore. All right. Let's go back to sharing the screen. We'll go to the Chrome tab there where it says upload your emoji all right name our emoji we're going to name it mantis because we're so imaginative we'll select the image mantis emoji here there we go and save and publish and now we have a mantis emoji added. Let's come over here and see if it's available. Okay. Doesn't show yet. Close that. It's possible that they might want to wait. They might want to wait until they've had a chance to make sure that it's not uh, offensive. All right, where, where are my... Okay, it's not in the list yet. So they're, they're going to have to review it. They're going to have to review it before, uh, before it becomes available. All right. All right, so pretty soon we're going to have that new emoji. Yay. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. Da -da -da.
Don't do it. <laughs> okay. Killing hummingbirds and their murders. Um, I've never seen one kill a hummingbird. I guess they could. <laughs> oh, needle nose rainbow chickens. I mean, yeah, mantises are uh, our top predators. You want Japanese beetles, really? <laughs> I was thinking about getting a ladybug, adding a ladybug. Okay, our next one, our next one, probably almost definitely a ladybug for our next one. Oh uh, yeah, that's a that's a Windows graphic user interface. <laughs> All right, so Japanese beetles, good bugs or bad? Depends. Are they in your house? <laughs> All right, let's see. Grows what I thought were nematodes, not found out later. Nematodes are small. These, yeah. Um, most nematodes, you're not going to be able to see them with the naked eye. Hmm. Tonight, we are drinking Cayman Jack mojitos. I didn't feel like mixing my own. Now, big, fat, white, grayish colored grubs. Those turn into beetles. And the chickens love them. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So whenever YouTube gets done reviewing our new emoji, we'll have it available. Yay. And the chickens love grubs. I found uh I found a pupae in the in the backyard uh yesterday while I was planting some raspberry bushes. Raspberry canes are not bushes yet. I'm just planting the individual canes. Eventually, they'll become bushes. And after I found it, the chicken found it, and now the pupae is gone. Hi, kitty. Yeah, little kitty, get in here. I have used Nemo. Yeah. Um, it works. The only problem with Nemo is I can't grow it here. Now I can grow some other things for, for insecticides. Um, I can grow a tobacco, which is kind of like a, a nuclear weapon for insecticide. It kills everything. But uh, if you have a situation where you really, really need to use a poison to get rid of, to get rid of bugs, you can use tobacco. Things like peppermint are good for confusing the, the the scent receptors of insects and making them not be able to find the plants through through searching through the pheromones. Lavender also helps with that helps in that respect. So, trying to disguise the scent of your plants is helpful. Joe's saying, then again, a prickly black caterpillar looks wicked, but the beautiful shiny black butterfly it turns into is so real and so beautiful. Mm, yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds when it comes to caterpillars and, and butterflies. On the one hand, butterflies are great. They're pollinators. On the other hand, caterpillars can destroy a lot of, uh, a lot of things. So what are you going to do? If you want the butterflies, you have to suffer the caterpillars. Grasshoppers and Katie Diz buy the boatloads. That means you've got a lot of chicken food. Chicken food or uh, or food for your for your blue jays. Other birds, guinea fowls will eat uh, grasshoppers and Katie Diz too. Mmm. Secret weapons and plans to build a chicken moat. Oh yeah. So you have your chicken run going all around the outside of the garden. <laughs> Anything that wants to get in there has to pass by the chickens first.
All right, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like moats. <laughs> you can build them with chickens. You can build them with, with, with well, water and put fish in them. And fish love grasshoppers, too. It's my favorite cat, uh, favorite catfish bait is grasshoppers. I'll go down to the, the banks of the river with just the pole and a hook and nothing else. Well, and a line, a line attached to the anyway. So I have a pole, line, hook, that's it. You know, cane pole, piece of twine with a bent piece of wire on the end of it. And then snatch a grasshopper off the bank, put it on the hook, and then swing it out there into the water. It'll hit the water. A second later, I've got a catfish. Bring the catfish in. Take it off. There's, there's still some grasshopper left. Great. Put it back out in the water. Get another catfish. Bring it in. And keep on doing that until I have as many catfish as I want. And then I take catfish back home and it's dinner time. It takes me about five minutes to feed 10 people <laughs> in the middle of summer, anyway. Because this catfish will just sit there right by the bank. They're waiting. The grasshopper misses a jump, doesn't time things properly, hits the surface of the water, and catfish has got it. Yep. Yeah, you get the line and I get the pole. We'll go fishing in the catfish hole, honey. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Neem oil works just fine. There's, there's, there's no reason not to use it other than... Uh, if you if you can't produce it wherever you live, you might want to try to find an alternative that you can actually produce yourself. My 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 disagreement with using neem oil is simply that I don't have a a guaranteed line of supply to neem oil. If everything falls to pieces tomorrow, the the things that I have available that I can produce myself, that's what I've got, and one of them doesn't happen to be be neem oil, so. That's the reason why I don't want to be dependent upon it. Other than that, yeah, it works fine. It works works absolutely great. You can kill cockroaches with neem oil. <laughs> that's that should tell you it works really well. All right, so which are prices? Plants to expand the pond. It's two thousand gallons at two feet deep. You want tilapia and cats for the winter. Tilapia must be introduced in grand for yeah. Um, well, the catfish are gonna <laughs> gonna eat whatever they can get. Mmm, nothing more tasty than the bread, catfish fillets, and fries for dessert, and a big juicy slice of watermelon. Yes, Nemo will kill will kill cockroaches. Uh, Diatomaceous earth will kill cockroaches too. It takes it a while, though. If you have a, a container that you can let your cockroaches crawl into, put some diatomaceous earth at the bottom of it, and then the cockroaches will crawl in and crawl into the diatomaceous earth. And after a little while, they'll start getting sluggish, and then they'll stop moving entirely, and then they just die. It will kill them, but it takes a while. All right. So grow the tilapia big first so, so the, uh, the catfish don't kill them. I'm really interested in the idea of growing um, of growing gray flathead mullet, if we can do it. The problem is the, the mullet likes to, uh, kind of like salmon, they like to spend part of their life in salt water and the other part of their life in, uh, in fresh water. But they're kind of exactly the opposite of salmon in that respect, because salmon will go to the fresh water and swim upstream to spawn. And the mullet goes out to sea to spawn. They will only spawn at sea. And then they come in and and they can adjust the the salinity of their bodies like uh, like salmon and like bull sharks do, and they will they'll spend their their growing up period until they get big in freshwater. But if we can figure out a way that we can get them to spawn in uh, artificially created pools inland, that would be great. Otherwise, we have to capture them uh, as as fingerlings. And try to try to grow them out that way. Neem oil, diatomaceous earth, kill cockroaches. Yep. Um, <laughs> bull sharks. Eek. 
Um, let's see. Eastern and Western red cedar also has a, a negative effect on cockroaches. Combine that with some diatomaceous earth, and you've got a pretty potent weapon against them as well. All right, what's everybody all to, up to out there? Mud sharks from your mythology. Mm. Why mullets? Um, I like mullet because they can survive in cooler waters than, than tilapia. Tilapia need at least 55 degrees for your water temperature. And mullet can survive at slightly lower temperatures, which means you can get away with, with growing them out at more northern or more southern uh, uh, latitudes, depending upon whether you're in the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. Um, their growing period is spent inland in freshwater. So um, if you've got a pond that you're raising fish in, you can raise mullet in that pond and you can feed them on a vegetarian diet which is kind of important trying to come up with the feed that you're going to feed your fish i mean a lot of people like to corn feed catfish of course that means you need to grow the corn in order to feed the catfish not really a great use of uh, land resources but if you can grow an aquatic plant that the, that the fish will eat, then you've got the feed for the fish already in the pond and you're not taking up extra space to grow the feed for the fish. It's basically you've got water that you can use for everything else and it's also giving you fish. So that's the reason why you'd want to have something that can survive on, on plants. The other alternative, of course, is to grow small feeder fish that can live on, on, your, on your plant material that's in your aquatic environment and then allow uh, the larger fish to feed on those, and then you fish for the for the for the the, the predator fish. All right, how often do I drop diatomaceous earth? Very rarely. I usually only apply diatomaceous earth uh, whenever I feel there's some particular reason to do so. Most of the time, I would rather just let nature sort itself out. But I'll put diatomaceous earth around baseboards and crevices and cracks and places where bugs are coming into the house. That's pretty much the only time I use it is to, to, to keep things from coming in. Of course, we already have plenty of bugs in the house already. Getting rid of those are a pain in the backside. All right. Stoned ape is ogling his new oka. Ooh. <laughs> All right, let me see here. So let me see. What do you know about wild plum folks? They're small. They're scrappy. They have a stooling habit. They don't grow up into a big tree. They grow up into a whole bunch of small branches like a thicket. Um, using wild plum as a rootstock is not a great idea for grafting onto because of that stooling habit. You'll get a lot of small wild plum trees growing up around the the uh, the one cultivated variety the one cultivated variety will get bigger than the supporting uh, branch that you, you grafted it onto. So if you're going if you're going to grow wild plums, and I'm not saying don't because I mean they're they're hardy they they like to grow it's hard to kill them, but don't use them as a rootstock. And Gail's got a fever. All right, Gail. I want you to look at the screen and go like this. Ah, uh, all right, all right, are you, are you looking? Okay, let me see here. I don't know, it just says 86. <laughs> well, I hope you get to feeling better. Uh, yarrow is good. Yeah, yarrow is good as a fever reducer. Uh, willow is good for good as, good as a fever reducer. But ah, but of course, you know, the purpose of having a fever is to raise the temperature so that the the, the microbes get killed off. So 
uh, something to do whenever you got a fever. Just get the get the blanket and get a whole bunch of water and some some vitamin C. You mix up your vitamin C in your water and drink that. Wrap up in the blanket and just get to sweating. Kill off whatever is whatever is ailing you. Okay, so you're going to use some uh, wild plums as a barrier. Yeah, that would make a pretty good barrier, I think. Making a hedge. To write, what, no whiskey? Yeah, I'm, I'm, out, of, I'm out of whiskey. Mary drank it all. And I didn't feel like mixing up a fresh drink, so. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of rationing my peppermint right now. I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to conserve it all for growing, uh, for growing new starts of peppermint instead of drinking it. Mm. Probably, yeah. Yep. Well, I've got a 95 degree temperature on the palm of my hand. I have hot hands. Yeah, I, it, it, it makes it convenient. I can I can take this thing and I can point it over here at the grow tent. Okay, no, I can point it at the grow tent and, okay, I can point it right there. And in a second, I can know that the temperature of my my pepper plants there is 87 degrees. So it's 87 degrees for my, for my, uh, for my, my bell peppers. I can put it over here at the, at the Cayennes. They're actually at 86. And the heater is, um, the heater is 126. So I can really quickly just zap, know what the temperature is. And this is kind of interesting. That that little oil heater is 126 degrees. I, I got this little fan. And I put that on there. And after it heats up, I was able to give it a little nudge. And just the heat from that oil heater would keep the fan blade turning, which is kind of interesting because this thing works on. Remember uh, last week when I was talking about thermocouples? That's how this works. It's got It's got a little element in here that takes the heat and exchanges it for an electrical current for microvoltage. <laughs> so that little experiment that I did, this is, I did that experiment with the, the little heater that's intended to go on top of your wood stove to make a fan blow the air around a room. I experimented with putting on top of the oil heater, which as I just pointed out, only 126 degrees. That's enough to create a voltage. So I know that if I take a thermocouple and I apply it to the to, to the stack on top of the house, if we have a, a passive geothermal system, we apply that thermocouple up there on the stack. I know that we can create a voltage. And if we can create a voltage, then we can do fun things like with it or fun things with it, like maybe run a dehumidifier so we can stop from uh, having a, a humidity build up inside the house when we're using geothermal to cool it. Or we can run a uh, maybe we can run a pump. So if I've got a if I've got a, a, a cistern down below the coils underground that catches that extra moisture condensation from whenever the air, air comes into the coils and condenses, instead of having it sit there and grow mold and stuff underground, we can have it divert off into a cistern and then using that thermocouple on the stacks, run a pump to pump it up and out and water the garden. So free power for applications and it's all solid state, no moving parts. <laughs> Where shot project says every time I get tested at 96.5 temperature, they use many temperature tests. Test me as nurse gave up and said, That's just him. And let me, in. yeah, that's I'm, I'm very rarely ever 98 degrees. If I'm 98 degrees, I'm running a fever. There's Connor Williams says, don't know who you are. I don't know who Connor William is either. Never met Connor William before, but hello. Let's 
see. Yeah, what is my temperature right now if I was actually to take it? All right. uh, okay, we're 96, 96.2. I actually feel pretty warm <clears throat> because that heater is right next to me and it's just kicking out the heat. All right, questions. This is supposed to be a Q&A session. You're supposed to be trying to stop me. Guys, ask me questions. What do you want to know? <sighs> oh. Oh, if you're 98 degrees, you peaked in the 90s. <laughs> hmm. That is funny. That is some funny stuff. I was watching a, I was watching a Napoleon Hill presentation just before uh, we started the live stream, and um, I was almost done with it. One of the things that uh, the alfalfa has not germinated yet, Amy. Um, one of the things that that, that that was impressed upon me was we all enter the world naked, and we uh, <laughs> we come in the same way. We don't have anything. We're de we're dependent upon other people to take care of us, and from that point, we get to make our decisions about. Um, what we're going to do with our lives. So one of the questions that you should all be asking is how, how do I go about what, first off, what do I want out of um, this particular channel that you're watching right now? What do you want out of life and how can this channel help you get there? And then start asking some questions. Um, I've got a notebook here that was somewhat important to that, but I've got questions now. So I'm going to answer this. Um, let me see here. Da -da -da. Is it easy to grow black walnut trees? Asked Joe Serrano. Yes. It's easy to grow the black walnut trees. The hard part is figuring out what you're going to grow in conjunction with the black walnut trees because they, they don't play nicely with everything else. Uh, what's the average speed of a European swallow? Just fast enough. With a coconut. <laughs> What variety of white clover do you use? SS for S red. Would red clover do the same thing for pets? Um, I use Trifolium repens. Repens? Repens. I don't know. It's, it's Latin. Pick your pronunciation, uh, which is Dutch white clover. It grows to be anywhere from 12 to 14 inches. And would red clover work? Yeah, red clover would work. Uh, there's there, there are there are perennial red clovers that you could use as well. Um, the perennial red clover gets a bit bigger which means you'll have to do more maintenance of it than, than with the Dutch white clover, but it all depends upon what you want. If you want to have something that you're going to cut back once during the season, and then it will stay trained to about that height for the rest of the season, go with the Dutch white clover. Um, I think the red clover will train the same way, but it'll have a tendency to get bigger if you let it. The Dutch white clover will put on flowers sooner. So if you're looking to attract uh, early pollinators, go with the Dutch white clover. If you're looking for more biomass overall, get the red clover. If you want color, I don't know, red clover is pretty. I've, I've seen some growing wild. I, I like it. All right, let me see here. That was about clover. Okay, talk to you about starting trees from season. Now you've done red buds and doing a lot of different things this year, and we'll to hear about your experience. Okay, so starting trees from seeds is, is fairly simple. You just need to understand what the natural germination conditions for that particular tree are. What what how is how does nature propagate that tree? So, say for example, you've got a yopon holly, which I'm going to be propagating a lot of here pretty soon as soon as they start producing berries for me. Uh, ordinarily, what nature does is uh, nature has a bird come along and eat those seeds. They 
seeds pass through the digestive tract of the bird, the bird flies, lands somewhere and excretes it. So you would need to treat it with acid or with that hot water treatment, same as for the red buds. A lot of seeds are that way. Um, in the case of uh, say a nut, nuts, whether they're acorns or hazelnuts or pecans or any one of those mast type uh, trees, whenever the nuts fall from the tree, most often you're gonna have wild animals that'll come by, pick up the nuts and stash them away for, for, for eating later. So they need to be taken and they need to be buried, obviously. Um, the best chance of reproduction for them is whenever it's been a good year and the animals don't get around to their caches and eat all those nuts. So you bury them. <laughs> Pretty much all you have to worry about for most of your nut trees is burying the seed. And then from there, it'll it'll get enough moisture in the seed coat that it'll break down by the next time the next year rolls around, it'll be ready to, to germinate and pop out. Not very difficult to germinate uh, tree seeds like that. What is the most difficult plant for you to grow? Mm. That's a tough question. At the moment, I'm having a hard time getting rosemary seeds to germinate properly. I've got lavender to sprout. I've got oregano to sp sprout. I got plenty of mint to sprout. But uh, I didn't really have a lot of success with the... Uh, with the rosemary from seed, but that's probably because it was really old seed. I've got a few cuttings that I took of the rosemary bush that are doing okay. <laughs> They're black walnuts too. Well, some things do grow in conjunction with black walnuts. Um, a Google search should give you a pretty good list fairly quickly. Off the top of my head, pears will grow with black walnuts. Just saying pears. I can't recall what else off the top of my head. Just no pears are one of the things that you can grow. Okay, so Joe says, I remember you commented to me, honey mesquite is a tree for me in the extreme south to grow. Looking for seeing if the local uh, Wisash is related. Is that right? We, we saw, we, we, we saw, we saw, we Or is it, do you pronounce the at the, at the end? It's related to the same tree. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, may 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 not necessarily be honey mesquite. There are a variety of different mesquites, and uh, and all of them grow pretty well. Honey is just a good one to pick out for uh, for the pods because they're 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 really good for eating. Let's see. Uh, Chris Clever Craft. Chris says, All I want out of life right now is to support the live stream of a man with similar spiritual beliefs as myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a nice goal. What else? <laughs> I want to see, ultimately, I'd like to see all, all of humanity to be able to. Uh, to, to survive on this planet and wherever else we choose to go without having the uh, the, the conflicts and worries and, and stresses that we currently have on us. I think life should be a lot more simple than we make it. We have a tendency to unnecessarily complicate things. Okay, so as for threads, we started plums and cherries last year, just planting the season as well. We ate the fruit, some came, some came up. Yeah, just planting stone fruit. Okay, stone fruit's different. Stone fruit is actually different. Um, stone fruit requires a stratification process. Of course, hazelnuts and, and pecans require a stratification process as well, where you, they go through a cold cycle. Um, sometimes you get enough cold just planting them outside in the soil, and sometimes you need to introduce the cold deliberately, like I'm doing with the uh, with the red buds. I've got a, a little cottage cheese container that I put a little bit of peat moss in and soaked it and then put the seeds in there and covered it with a little bit more and then put it in the, free, in the, not the freezer, but the fridge. And the idea is that stays in there for five weeks so that those red bud seeds have a, a good, long, consistent chill period. They probably don't need quite that long, but just to, just to be sure. 
give them their best chance, we'll go ahead and give them a, a good long cold period. They don't necessarily have to be frozen. I mean, some do, but below below 40 degrees for an extended period of time. Make them think that they've been through a winter. And that's simply because nature sets that biological clock so that the seed doesn't germinate in the fall. If it germinated in the fall, then it would be a tender seedling as winter approach that would die off and the, the tree wouldn't reproduce. Mel says she's back. She had a call. All right. And Wishar Project says black walnuts are murderous to extract. Oh, yeah, they are. They're hard to get out of the shell. They're tasty. They're very, very good, but they're they're hard to get out. And we used to sit there with a ball peen hammer and just bang, 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 bang trying to crack those crack those shells. Okay, Joe is saying what is known as buckwheat in English up north is known as alfalfon. Okay. So you've got buckwheat growing down there in uh, in southern Mexico. That's kind of cool. I hadn't looked into the into the range of the plant. Of course, I'm growing uh I'm growing amaranth, which grows all the way, all the way down to the Andes. <laughs> Sassafras Red says, "Dude, I want a source of yopon leaves. Um, you should be able to get some. Try the try a home and garden center. Um, I know, crazy, right? But the home and garden center should have uh, yopon, uh, the uh, the Alex Palmateria umbrella." Uh, cultivar of the the yopon holly, which is the weeping yopon holly. They sell it as an ornamental shrub, and they grow a lot further than the the original native range of of yopon holly was. And presumably, umbelletta has a better quantity of caffeine in the leaves than uh, than the, the the normal wild variety. Okay, Wixar Project says Jason will freezing my cherry seed trees. My cherry seed trees hurt them all. You mean your cherry tree seeds? Uh, been in there unloved and forgotten about since last November. Are they viable or not? Do I do, do, I do bad things? Uh, I don't know if you'd want to have them frozen all winter. Exposed to freezing temperature for, for, for a few weeks, maybe. But I don't know if frozen would be good. Then again, there have been plants that have been trapped in glacier ice for thousands of years, and whenever the the situation came up where they could actually germinate, they did just fine. So, tell you what, find them, <laughs> find out. But usually, uh, usually five to eight weeks of of just below forty degree temperatures is good enough to uh, to to be a, a stratification period for germinating stone fruit. Okay. Experimentalfarmnetwork.com has you upon seeds. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay. We're starting asking about average chilling length. I was saying five to eight was usually sufficient. Do persimmon overwinter in southern Virginia? I actually don't know which are project. <laughs> I don't know if they overwinter in Virginia. Zone six A to seven A. Um, I know I know that they can survive in in zone seven without any difficulty because I've, I've seen them growing wild on the hills in uh, southwestern Missouri. From the time I was. 15 to the time I was 17, I was out there foraging every day. I knew where every persimmon tree was on those hills. And they survived just fine without anybody tending them. So they can survive at that latitude. I don't think they're going to stay. They're not going to keep their leaves. But they will survive. Gail was asking if I've got anything. I, I am way behind. Sorry, guys. Let me see. Uh, Joe Serrano was asking about hickory nuts. Aren't those Yule Gibbons' favorite nut? But it's range is east of the Mississippi, right? Uh, you can find hickory all the way across North America. 
uh, east of the Mississippi was one of the places where they were deliberately being cultivated by by the natives before the before the uh, the Spaniards and the and the Dutch and the English showed up. And there was a lot of hickory nut being grown uh, east of the Mississippi. And west of the Mississippi is where you found the pecans being grown by a different set of natives. And apparently they did not necessarily get along really well. Otherwise, pecans would have been found east of the Mississippi before uh, before Thomas Jefferson got his hands on some. Um, but hickory nuts are good, too, if you can get them. Let's see. Stone Date Farmer says persimmon, goji, violets, pawpaws, I think, are on the list of things. Okay. Yeah, if you've got the PDF, you can just put it up there. I need to put that PDF or get another list and put it up there somewhere. Gail was asking if I've got anything planted in the ground yet. Um, I've got clover and I've got uh, alfalfa planted in the ground. I was thinking about getting started on planting uh, lentils either tomorrow or the next day. I would have done it earlier today, but I was feeling lazy. And of course, I've planted a lot of uh, I've planted a lot of dormant trees over the past week or so, which I'll have some videos coming out later about later on about planting those dormant trees. Okay. Paul says Midwest Permaculture website has a great list of plants that are compatible with walnuts. Yeah. That's probably where I last saw that list, actually. Okay, so yes, the E at the end is pronounced on that word I was talking about earlier. Okay, cool. Southern Work Woodworking Homestead says, hello, Jason. Hello, Southern Work Woodworking Homestead. All right. Yeah, Stone Date Farmer is on a, uh, I think it's a western facing slope in Oregon. I could be wrong about being western facing. I think it's western facing. Let me see. Yeah, some pepper trees are going to be out on Friday. I have two different varieties of pepper trees. And <clears throat> I mispronounced the scientific name for the pepper trees in the video, just so you know. <laughs> They're supposed to be xanthoxylum, and I pronounced them xyloxanthum over and over and over and over again. I don't know why. Okay. Sasperus Fred says, I love Adaptive Seed Company from up here. One Green World is a good Pacific Northwest company. One Green World. Hmm. Yeah. Hang on a second. Wait. Hold that thought. Come here. One Green World. Uh, let's see. There's their, there's their logo right there. <laughs> That's where I got my... Uh, where I got my pepper trees. Uh, Sichuan and Sancho pepper trees. They have a waiting list. Uh, if, if you want to get them from One Green World, which is about the only place I know that you can get live uh, Sichuan peppers from, uh, the trees anyway, get on the waiting list now <laughs> because it's about two years to get them <laughs> if you get on the list. <laughs> Okay, cool. I, I, I was looking at the way the light, Joe, or um, uh, Matt, I was looking at the way the light fell on your on your property whenever you're taking some videos, and it looked like it was west facing to me. But, yay, cool. <laughs> I guessed it right. All right. So you got your sea buckthorn from uh, One Green World. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So Joe is interested in knowing uh, about pecans and the hickory nuts. Okay. And Stone Date Farmer says, speaking of land races, are you working on any? Uh, the last land race seed I worked on adapting was uh, a land raced. Uh, well, actually, I've got two. I've got a basil that I've got that's, that's germinated really, really well. And uh, I've got an okra. There's a Clemson spineless that, that I've got developed that's really great for, for, for our zone. But I'm thinking about working on a cowhorn variety next and, and getting it getting it trained to grow well here. Uh, 
uh, which are projects that are imported, all imported fruits radiated as far as you know. I have no idea. I don't know what they do whenever they import the stuff. Yeah, Yopan Holly is, yeah, well outside of the native range for, for Oregon anyway. It'll probably grow there. And Conrad, Paul, you didn't know about Yopan Holly? Okay, so, okay, we get to introduce uh, Conrad Homestead to, to, to the benefits of Yopan Holly. Uh, for thousands of years, there was a, a, a holly tree called the Yopan Holly. It grows along, or Ilex vomitaria is the, the, the Latin name for it. It grew east of the Appalachian Mountains, particularly in the southeast. So uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, all the way down into Florida. Um, the natives would grow this, and they would harvest the leaves, and lightly, well, first they would take the, take the leaves, um, wilt them, roast them, and then make a tea out of the leaves, and they would drink that black drink out of the, the holly leaves. It's uh, loaded with caffeine. It's just, it's just like drinking tea from China or uh, coffee from South America. But uh, for ceremonial purposes, they would actually consume the berries, which would induce vomiting. Hence, Ilex vomitaria, which is a poor name for the plant. It's a great plant. But uh, part of the overdosing on the, the berries would induce a uh, an altered state of consciousness. Put it that way. Not that I would recommend eating Yopan holly berries for a hallucinogen. There's, <laughs> there's better ways to have a transcendent experience. Hmm. All right. But simply because I have a hard time growing Camellia sinensis here in 7A, and I can't grow coffee at all here in 7A, I decided to give growing the Yopan Holly a try. It grows here as an ornamental plant, so I know it grows. Yopan holly actually likes water. It's uh, one of the plants that can actually have wet feet and still survive. All right. Let me see here. All right. Pecans and hickory nuts. Um... I believe hickory and pecan and walnut are all members of the Juglandacea family. So they're the same family of trees, but different genotypes. Uh, hickory and pecan don't produce as much or any, in some cases, of that uh, hormone that is harmful to other plants. So they play a little bit better with other plants than, than uh, the walnuts. Both the Carpathian walnuts are English walnuts and black walnuts. But they're all related. And a lot of them should be able to grow far, far south. I mean, all the way down to the equator. Carl's off the grid is going to plant his pecan tree soon. As soon as it, as soon as the the as soon as the snow goes away, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And every time I scroll down, I wind up missing a bunch of stuff. So here we go. Okay, so Stone Day Farmer is saying okra is one that I'm working on. It does not like our climate. So, yeah, okra is a, a form of hibiscus, and it likes a long, hot period. So if you live in an area where you don't have a long, hot period, uh, you want to find some way to increase the soil temperature around your okra plants if you're trying to grow okra. So something that will capture and absorb heat and, and keep your, uh, your root zones warm. Oh, we're past an hour. Let me get to the bottom of the comments here and uh, and finish up. How do I extract blueberry seeds and know which ones are viable? Um, if the fruits got ripened all the way, or at least most of the way, then the the seeds are most likely viable. But to extract them, uh, blueberries are one of those one of those uh, fruits that birds like to eat, and just like everything else in, in that category, expose it to uh, a weak acid solution for half an hour 
or boil them for a minute or put them in, not boil them for a minute, but put them in boiling water for a minute to soften up the seed coat. Okay, Mary is saying, I've hauled pineapple, but never thought about what happened to them before they get to our ports. I think they grow some here in, in the continental U.S. too. Have you ever heard of a multi-column cactus, the blueberry-sized berry sweet chock full of seeds? Hmm. No, I haven't, but I'll I'll look into it, Joe. Let's see. Develop like prickly pears, but instead of growing growing pads, they're columns. Okay. We have a lot of prickly pears around here. Yeah, chances are if you've got a wild holly growing, it's probably not a yup on holly. Quickshare sure Project says, is it best to avoid composting black walnut leaves per garden bed? Nah, it's fine to compost the leaves. The the living roots of a black walnut tree are, is what exudes the, the jugalone hormone. The leaves don't have any in it. It's just it just comes out of the live roots. So wood, leaves, bark are fine. You can you can compost those. And it doesn't doesn't produce a problem. All right. NK Anurag, how to make saltpeter. Got a question. You have a prickly pear from Jersey Sassafras Red says, "Cool, yeah. I mean, they'll they'll um they'll grow in Zone Seven. I think they'll grow as far north as Zone Five. Or the elderberry needs both scarification and acidification to germinate. Mm -hmm. Definitely acidification. I don't know if they're going to need scarification or not. Stratification probably." I could look it up. I haven't tried propagating elderberry through uh, sexual reproduction in a while. And most of the time, elderberry you're gonna you're gonna propagate through uh, through vegetative propagation. All right. So potassium nitrate. You need a, a source of nitrified earth to make potassium nitrate. And you can get that source of nitrified earth from old deposits of manure like guano that you find in a cave from the bats. You can get it out of a stockyard. Stockyards are great because you have a lot of animals that are pooping there over and over and over again for a period of time. Uh, you can also get it from, from uh, any place where there's lots of dung or urine that's soaked into the ground. In the case of, of manures, you want to have enough time to have gone by that bacteria can have worked on the ammonia, the urea that's in your material, decompose that to ammonia, decompose the, the ammonia to nitrates, and then you just need to extract the nitrates from that material. And you do that by taking it, soaking it in hot water, allowing the solid material to settle out to the bottom, draining off the liquid portion. So you just have liquids, filter that to get rid of any remaining floating organic material. So you just have the, the liquor itself. Introduce calcium carbonate to that in, in a fairly large quantity. Uh, I'd say probably around about two cups of calcium carbonate per gallon of hot water. It still needs to be hot whenever you do this. Stir it, allow it to settle down. This is called flocculation. The calcium carbonate will cause solid mineral, mineral salts to precipitate out of the, the mixture. Remove the remaining lay, the, the liquid portion from that, filter it out, and then introduce a catalyst, for example, copper wire or copper tubing into the vat where you're, you're con concentrating your lay to allow it to evaporate. Some people like to boil it. I would prefer to just allow it to naturally evaporate it out. The crystals start to, co uh, to accumulate and form on your catalyst, the copper coil that you have coming up out of it, and they'll grow up the side of it, and then you just wipe the crystals off, set them to the side. You can refine them later if you want a more concentrated project or a product. And that, of course, you can use for treating heart palpitations. Not that I'm a doctor, but that's one of the things that it's used for. Uh, also, preserving your food, like making uh, uh, corned beef and stuff like that. Obviously, you can use it as a as a component for uh, propellant if you're making, say, a, a, nit a, a silver nitrate rocket to seed clouds with, so you can get rainfall during uh, times that you wouldn't ordinarily get it. I do not know Hindi language. No, I'm sorry. 
I am I'm familiar with 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 some Hindi topics, but I don't know the language, unfortunately. Anyway, so that would be how you get potassium nitrate. The the the, the quick version. And I'll have a I'll have a video later on about June where I'll take a portion of nitrified earth and get the nitrate out of it. So Sasspress Red says we have native prickly pear in southern Illinois. Huh? Cool. They grow quite a bit north. I've seen a couple of different varieties of uh, prickly pear cactus fruit. You got the, the, the purplish ones and the red ones. I would classify them as edible, but not my favorite thing to eat. <laughs> Yucca fruit, not necessarily my favorite thing to eat either. It's yeah, it's edible, but all right, we're uh, almost to an hour and a half. Did I miss anything? Okay, have you ever had your hands in aquaponics and hydroponics together? Uh, not as a uh, not as a, a closed loop system. I, I've I've had the experience of working with a uh, uh, a much more open system where there was a, a stock pond that was stocked with fish, and then the manure from the fish in in the pond was used whenever the uh, whenever the crops are irrigated, and that works pretty well. So. A smaller closed loop system with 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 aquaponics makes a lot of sense to me. I would love to do more with it, but getting those set up is expensive. I mean, you can do you can do it on the cheap, but doing it on the cheap and doing it well are two different things. <laughs> All the same, I think there's a lot of potential for for aquaponic systems, especially in places where the climate is not conducive to growing in the ground. Uh, a lot of places which are ordinarily deserts, you might be able to drill down deep enough to hit groundwater somewhere deep below and bring it to the surface, but that uses a lot of energy. And then what do you do with it once you've got, got it there? But if you have an enclosed environment, a closed off in green, greenhouse that you're raising your, your, uh, your fish in and raising your plants in, um, you have the potential to be able to produce a lot of food even in a desert with a, a closed loop aquaponic system. That's nice. I, I would like to do some, but it's it's more of a, one of these days I'll do it. It's, it's not in my immediate plans. Hello, Simply Jan Homestead. Hi. We're about done, I think. I think, I think. Yeah, we've been here for about an hour and a half. Hey, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out and spending some time with us today. Um, I just think of some more questions that you'd like to ask. Um, maybe put them in the comments after the after the video um, comes up because I probably didn't catch everything that, that, that people were saying. And I can I can reply to some of those independently. In any case, thanks for stopping by, and uh, you guys have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will catch you next time.